To get things started off today, I want to just talk a little bit here about um, the fact that we're seeing, obviously, an increasing number of UAS operators that are requesting access to our nation's airspace. And whether it's the large UASs like the, like the Global Hawks or the Predator class aircraft or some of the smaller UASs, there's going to be some very key impacts both on controllers as well as the entire air traffic system. Communications and control link for beyond visual line of sight are just a, just a couple of issues of some of the things that we're going to be, have to be facing as an industry. So to talk about some of these things, it's my pleasure to introduce Brigadier General Paul Nelson, who serves as the Director of Strategic Growth within the Business Development and Strategy Effort for the Intelligence, Information, and Services business of Raytheon. And he's going to be our moderator for the first session um, this afternoon. Uh, Paul recently joined Raytheon after serving 20 years in the US Air Force, where he became an expert on, in an intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance with exceptional operational cyber ex experience. He's had substantive senior leadership experience with the U US intelligence community and the Department of Defense. So I'll turn it over to you, Paul. Thank you. Great, uh, and thanks, Terry. And Thanks to uh, RTCA for hosting this symposium and inviting us to come up here. Uh, we're honored to be here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, uh, and welcome to the first panel uh, in the afternoon session. Uh, so this isn't my first rodeo. Uh, I know how tough it is in that coveted slot right after lunch, uh, when you all have a full stomach and you're probably looking for that dopamine hit to check on the email uh, and do a little work on it. So we'll try to stimulate your thinking. Uh, we'll try to have some spirited interaction amongst it because we have a panel of experts uh, that have a passion for this and deep experience. Uh, we really want to answer your questions, uh, so I'd ask you to prepare your thought-provoking questions. Uh, you can use the email uh, to put them in or ask us uh, during the time frame, but we really want to get to the heart of what you want to hear. Uh, so as Terry mentioned, uh, UASs have been expanding, and, and to paraphrase our luncheon speaker, there's an explosion of UAS systems. Um, it has been growing exponentially on it, and if you looked at the 2018 FAA forecast, it's exactly what you would expect. Uh, up to 900,000 small users uh, already uh, registered, expect that to be a million next year to come through. The number of waivers for the small things has just been increasing exponentially. I don't remember the numbers, but it's exactly where you'd expect it to go, uh, continuing to, to uh, grow. Um, an interesting uh, waiver that the uh, FAA passed in uh, Springfield, Ohio, uh, where we have the first uh, large airspace for uh, beyond visual line of sight. Uh, it's 200 square miles, 200 square, 200 square miles of uh, unrestricted airspace from 1,000 to 10,000 feet to do some experimentation. Those are all the steps we would expect to happen. Um, but many of these are happening with a, a, a structured standard and process that I think we need to have. Uh, just one more example, uh, Fairfax County, where I live, uh, just recently completed a public discussion about uh, fielding UASs for safety and security. Um, and after a three-month session where citizens could put in comments, and I, I read through the comments, most of the comments, I would say anecdotally, 90% of them dealt with uh, um, uh, surveillance on it, right? So how do I ensure my you know, privacy? Perhaps 10% of them dealt with public nuisance. Uh, and at the end of this, Fairfax County implemented the approach. Uh, satisfactorily, they're going to use the FAA certification for small uh, UAS uh, pilots. Uh, but the challenge I think we face is that we have a county option happening all across the United States. So it's not really a question of if we need to have standards. It's not a question of when. It's a question of now. It's a time for us to work through it. And that's why RTCA, as this forum, for collaboration where we can talk through what are the processes and standards and we can actually drive uh, a decision on it. I think this is why it's an important topic and a, a good piece of discussion. So I do have an august group of uh, you know, personnel. Uh, my experience has been uh, you know, almost exclusively, well, I guess I would call it exclusively on the Department of Defense. Uh, I've been working with uh, UAVs or UASs since 1999. Um, everything from surveillance to attack and how do you put them in. I've dealt with it on the international side. 
But these gentlemen have a depth of experience uh, dealing with air, air traffic management and how do we field it and work through it. So I think you'll get some uh, great perspective on it. I'd like to start off with uh, Doug Davis, at least for a few opening comments on it. Uh, Doug started in 1984. I'm going to use a year, uh, with the FAA uh, in Jacksonville. Uh, he's been a, a first level supervisor in Atlanta, came up here to Washington, D.C. to work at FAA uh, in 2005, I think it was. Uh, he stood up the Unmanned Aircraft Program Office, a substantial effort. Um, though that organization is still driving uh, some of the efforts we see today. Uh, when he left FAA, he went to uh, New Mexico State University, uh, where he was a director for Global UAS Strategic Initiatives, and he's currently at Northrop Grumman as a director for the Office of Independent Airworthiness. He's leading the Northrop Grumman uh, Airworthiness Certification and Airspace Integration. He's also been active on a whole variety of committees on it that many of you know about. Uh, Canso Vice Chair of the Ops Steering Committee, Canso Rep to the IKO our past panel, and he's currently the chair of the IKO uh, UAS Ad Hoc Steering Group. Uh, Doug, if you'd give some opening comments, we'd uh, love to hear him, please. Okay, sure. Thanks, Paul. And, uh, and thanks to our CCA for being, uh, for being so gracious as to include me. I have to apologize first and foremost. I was told I was being on the, uh, asked to participate on a gray beard panel. So, <laughs> so I grew a gray beard. Uh, no, nobody else did here. In fact, uh, I've been subjected to ridicule by Rachel for having a stupid beard. Um, so you get what you pay for, right, at the end of the day. So, uh, you know, part of our, our dialogue in coming here, and uh, one of the things that our, our team asked me to do was to define, first of all, the, the discussion, the, the scope that we want to talk about. If you want to go to UTM class, if you want to go to drone stuff, uh, the FAA and their symposium up the road, I'm sure, is dealing with a lot of that right now. And there are uh, a lot of opportunities to go to small UAS kind of activities. Instead, what we wanted to focus on was the mid-size to large-size hail or pass, because that should be where our, our, our TCA uh, can weigh in and help us deal with traditional kind of standards development, uh, like uh, they've successfully done with the MOPS for detect and avoid. So, so that being said, as, as Paul mentioned, we started in 2005 when I was with the FAA standing up the office, and the first influx of demand on the government was for the bigs. It was for the bigs. And so consequently, what we call the bigs, at least the medium to, to large size hails, we began to set up an infrastructure to be able to issue many experimentals and push the demand uh, for detect and avoid uh, to our TCA, General Watrous at the time, it was good to see him. I hadn't seen him since then, I think almost, but good to catch up with Dave. Um, and, and so for about two years, almost exclusively, we spent a lot of time working with uh, the, the large size manufacturers. And then after a year or two of having experimentals, the demand seemed to wane uh, a little bit. And, and instead, it kind of flipped over into being uh, the demand for the small UAS. And so we had moved from the modelers into more of how do we deal with this tsunami of uh, small unmanned aircraft that's coming. So consequently, what we wanted to focus on here with this group is since there's a, a, a lot of people talking, everything from, uh, again, UTM to other kind of capabilities that are out there with uh, urban air mobility and other things, that we just focus on the traditional size and scope. So that being said, we identified several years ago what some of the shortfalls were uh, for large RPAS and unmanned aircraft, what needs to be dealt with and how do we move ahead. Things like, uh, and I wrote them down because I'm getting old, um, how, how does an air traffic controller clear uh, an unmanned aircraft like a Global Hawk or a Reaper for a visual approach um, when the capability is not there? How, how do you do visual separation? Uh, what kind of wake turbulence vortex criteria has been established yet? It hasn't. There are still some things that 10 or 15 years beyond when we began to create the capability haven't been dealt with yet and still need to, right, if we're going to break through this logjam. 
And then I think also we're going to see uh, largely not only in this pocket space of commercial applications, but also in the smaller things that are happening, the need to describe and define contingency operations, contingency planning. So we fought for 10 years to get 7400 identified as the Lost Link Beacon Code, right? And, and uh, with FAA support, we got it through ICAO. It's been approved, and it's not yet completely published yet. We're still having to fight it. Some Klingons are keeping us from going forward with it. I won't call their nation states out that are still doing it. But that being said, what happens next? So my platform goes 7400, goes Lost Link. What happens next? Um, do we, what, what does the air traffic controller expect to happen when that initiates? We can't come to resolution yet with that. We, we haven't decided. Right now, it's one off. In, in other words, we're accommodating. We're not integrating. We're tailoring the capability still. That's an expensive proposition. It takes a long time to do that. And then finally, I, I will tell you that the benefit of doing things the way that we have is that when we first stood up the office in 2005, 2006, we were getting a lot of lost link events. Uh, and, and commands would call up and say, hey, my so-and-so aircraft went lost link. I don't know where it is. Uh, it didn't return home. It didn't come back. And, and I got to tell you, in today's environment, that's not satisfactory. We were able to flex and deal with it as we needed to because it was a growth industry and a growth example. We tried to balance the risk as much as possible. Can you imagine that today in this hypersensitive UTM, UAM environment where I have a flyaway and it's okay if it doesn't come back? Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. I, I think that would bring things down. So all that goodness to say, I believe that over the past nine to 10 years, industry has stood up and said, we can make this better, and we have to. And I think to that point, they have. Uh, the incidents of, of Lost Link, where they will cause a detriment to the society or to uh, the efficiency of the NAS, has gone down dramatically. So that being said, I look forward to dialogue and look forward to discussion. Thanks, Paul. Great. Thanks, Doug. And uh, just to add on to the discussion about how far we've gotten uh, with UAVs. In 1999 and 2000, when I was dealing with uh, military UAVs in Bosnia and Kosovo on it, uh, it was a very frequent experience to lose them. Uh, and we have progressed a lot in terms of the standards about what are the safety process you would have? How do you deal with a lost link? Where do you, and so we're completely uh, I think improve that. Now, how do you start applying it to industry and how do we create the standards so that we're putting it across the and across the world on it? I think it's exactly uh, the right approach. So the next speaker I'd like to introduce is uh, Todd Dottoman. Uh, Todd has extensive global air traffic management experience, a variety of leadership experiences working at Census, and uh, now with uh, Talos. He was the Vice President of Strategy and Marketing for Air Traffic Management, currently the Vice President for Digital Aviation Business Segment, which is how do you apply digital into the entire entirety of the aviation industry that he has. Just like uh, Doug, uh, Todd serves on a whole variety of panels that I'm sure you're familiar with them. Uh, he serves on the RTCA Next Gen Advisory Committee, the CANSO Strategy and Integration Standing Committee, the CANSO UTM Drone Task Force, and the Dartmouth College Alumni Council. Um, I do have a question for you to start off, Todd, and then uh, would welcome some of your opening comments. But uh, we're seeing this uh, new users coming in uh, with UASs. Uh, and so in, in terms of their different uh, expectations and approach to it, um, are their needs different? Are they the same? Do we need to deal with them uh, in a, a new approach on it? So where do you see these new uh, UAS, uh, um, I guess, customers in terms of what their needs are? Sure. Thanks for the, the question, and thanks for the opportunity to, to speak today. I think um, one of the things, so earlier today, this morning, in fact, I pulled up some of the NGATS documents that were drafted uh, 12, 13 years ago to kind of refresh myself on what we were saying a decade and a half ago about what the future was going to look like. Um, and, you know, it's funny because what we said was the performance of vehicles in the airspace and the demands in the airspace were going to change radically. 
And we said, okay, in 20 years' time, we're going to have commercial space. We're going to have uh, UASs. We're going to have all, uh, uh, supersonic. We're going to have all these things. And today, it's been very interesting to hear boom, to hear commercial space, and and really to start to look at it. And and fundamentally, um, what we wrote about and believed would happen is happening. And uh, part of that is about the the envelope of performance of vehicles, which has changed substantially. Uh, we have many, many more types of vehicles that are flying in different ways. And so we look at these quadcopters, whether they're little ones or big ones for carrying people, they have a very different performance profile than um, a, a 737. Um, and we start looking at supersonic jets, and that, that brings in a whole other uh, aspect of it. And so that's one of the big challenges um, that I think we're facing with this introduction of UAS is the different performance profile of the vehicles. Um, but the second part of it is the business models are, are generally very different as well. Um, and so most of the aviation airspace usage today is by scheduled traffic, which has allowed us to create a very efficient and a very safe system because we know more or less the flows of traffic, how it's going to happen, where they're going to be, when they're going to be, and we've been able to work on the processes and tools and capabilities to serve that customer set pretty well. Uh, what we see even today without a lot of UAS is flying is when you have a disruption of weather, uh, an airport a runway closes or something like that, it disrupts this well-orchestrated system and causes lots of delays and problems. Uh, what we're going to see with these new users is in fact more ad hoc on-demand operations. So there won't be scheduled requests. And when we start talking about urban air mobility as an example, um, you know, you're going to have vehicles that are going to be operating in controlled airspace around large, busy airports uh, on demand, flying in places that we don't have a demand pattern for today. And so I think what we're going to experience and what we're going to recognize is a significant change in the demand profile and the, and the way that airspace is requested by many, many more types of vehicles and performance characteristics. Um, and that's, that's going to be... Um, that's going to be significantly challenging. What we said 10 or 15 years ago is, in fact, we needed to have systems in airspace that could be dynamic, that could be flexible, that could be responsive to changes. And I'm not sure that we've really quite delivered that yet. And so that's one of the big challenges um, ahead of us. And I think that um, uh, one of the additional challenges on top of that is around the whole trade-off between safety and security. Right, so we talked about cyber earlier in the day today. Um, I was up at the UAS, uh, the FAA UAS symposium in the last two days, and, and what, in the counter UAS d domain, one of the discussion points is, okay, so we have this safety, or the security issue of a rogue drone, and we want to do something to counter that, but do we create safety issues in the process of trying to solve it? And I think as we look at integration of UASs into the airspace, we have this trade-off between safety and security that we're going to be facing, whether it be flyaways uh, or, or other sorts of issues. Um, and that is, um, that's an extremely complicated multi-agency mm -hmm. topic um, that is, uh, that's going to be difficult to take over. Uh, the last point I think I would, I would highlight is, and it, it, it also is something that we, we sort of envisioned in the future early on, was that there is a need from the airspace users to have more say in how they use the airspace and to be more involved in the decision process when there are changes and when there's adjustments to be made. And I think for sure when we look at the UAS operators who want to fly, whether it be cargo delivery or border surveillance or any of the other missions that we talk about, uh, all of them expect to have a, a very large role in say in the decision-making process of um, how their, their operation is impacted by changes of traffic, of weather, of airspace availability, et cetera. And so there is this uh, user involvement in, in the decision-making cycles and processes that is absolutely expected by this new class of users that I think is something we also face as an industry. Perfect. Thanks, Todd. And uh, if we don't get a question from the audience later on, I would like to come back to the cyber piece because I think yes. that's an important topic yes. when you're talking about the UASs. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce our next speaker here, uh, Hank Krakowski on the far left-hand side down here. He served as the uh, COO 
of the FAA. He spent 30 years at United Airlines as a pilot. Uh, he was the uh, VP of Flight Ops, the chief pilot, and probably significantly for all of us in here, he was the VP of Safety, Security, and Quality. Extensive experience in our line of work in our business. He's currently the uh, CEO of Conure. Uh, aviation group uh, interested in safety, security, environment, uh, standards, uh, doing just a heck of a lot of work on things that are of interest to us. And I do have a question to start off uh, for you. Um, so I mentioned the Fairfax County right discussion. Uh, they had a very heavy three-month engagements with the public uh, before they, before they uh, came up with a, a plan and a policy to go do it. Using that as an example, uh, what are the stakeholders that we need to interact with when you're talking about UASs? Uh, you know, do we have the right uh, set of standards? Do we understand who the people are that need to be uh, included on it? Uh, do, we, do we know who the stakeholders that we've got to expand out? And so I, I welcome your thoughts on that, please. Okay, thank you, Paul, and thank you, RTCA. It's really been fun catching up with some of you again, like Terry, we work together at CAST and a whole bunch of other efforts in years past, so it's good to see you again, Terry. Uh, you know, what I'd like to do, this is a technical uh, room, a room full of technicians and having technical and regulatory discussions. <coughs> I want to open up the aperture a little bit, and to a degree it is, I've got scars on my back from it, as we at FAA tried to implement NextGen. And I always thought NextGen and the unmanned aircraft uh, proposals are together, and NextGen means next generation air transportation system. And uh, when we started to deploy some of the NextGen technologies and the NextGen CONOPS, when we started flying aircraft over areas that airplanes typically didn't fly over before near airports, the public uh, reaction was pretty swift and pretty uh, uh, active with us. Congress got involved, local politicians got involved. And while we're talking about the large vehicles here, integrating the large vehicles to me is not particularly a technical challenge or operational challenge. The system does that all the time. Helicopters, aircraft, you, you go to O'Hare in the morning, there's traffic helicopters flying underneath the arrival paths of jets in pretty close proximity. We know how to do this. Blimps, balloons, all kinds of different, different uh, uh, vehicles. Once the work is done at RTCA and through FAA and the uh, users, and we have confidence that the uh, command and control of these vehicles is solid and that the vehicles are going to do what needs to be done as if a pilot were in the aircraft, and that the controller interface all works really well, I'm not really worried about actually integrating these in. However, uh, Terry may remember this. Remember the Stoll runway at Philadelphia? Yeah. So uh, these aircraft don't necessarily have to be in the line three miles apart going into a big runway at an airport. I think what's likely going to evolve here is you might have some unmanned aircraft runways, shorter, maybe less capable, doesn't need lighting systems. You know, why would you need lights, as an example, for on a runway that an uh, unmanned aircraft is going to land on? But what does that do? That brings new vehicles in a proximity with people on the ground that were not there before. And you're going to have to start working with airports, the local population, bring in your local politicians, and you know, forbid if an accident or something happens, some of you in this room might be, for, be before Congress like I was when a helicopter and a light airplane uh, crashed into each other over the Hudson River. Uh, and there, there were congressmen at that hearing that wanted to shut down all light aircraft tra traffic over the Hudson River. And another one had a great idea of putting a radar dish underneath the George Washington Bridge. Uh, so we get a lot of help from Congress. You don't want to go there. That's what I'm trying to say, okay? You want to try to build this in a way that the community knows what you're doing, why you're doing this, what's the benefit to the community, what's the benefit to the local politics, to have these systems in the air, and make sure they understand that they're going to be treated perhaps differently than the current airliners going in and out of an airport. That only makes sense. So even though this is a technical discussion, always have your um, eyes open to what these other stakeholders need to be. Because I can tell you there are a lot of plans for next gen 
on routes and airports and arrival paths or takeoff paths that have not been executed because the public wouldn't have it. So all of that work we put in technically to develop those procedures were completely wasted. So let's not waste our time, let's stay ahead of it. Perfect, and thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce our last speaker here. To my left, uh, Carlos Cirillo has uh, extensive experience in international management uh, of both civil as well as military aviation. He was the uh, Brazilian delegate to ICAO uh, Air Navigation Commission, currently coming hailing from Montreal. Uh, at uh, IATA, he is the director of the ATM infrastructure on it. And just also interestingly, he still holds the rank of colonel in the Brazilian Air Force. Uh, so if you would, I'd like to start off with a question uh, you know, for you, Carlos. Um, so we're seeing an explosion in uh, UASs. We're seeing disruption caused by technology. We're seeing right, projected growth that continue to, to just uh, rise up on it. Is our current system capable of dealing with it, or do we need a completely new ATM system? And what challenges do you see in order to deal with not only the growth, but also the technology changes? Okay, thank you, Paul. An easy question. Okay, very easy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, RTC, for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, looking to what we have been discussing, I have some numbers here from Airbus I want to quote. Uh, there's an ex anticipation that by 2035, and any given hour, we'll have over the skies of Paris 156 commercial aircraft. 2,500 human mobility vehicles, 16, around 17,000 drones delivering cargo, 58 inspection drones, and 44 hobby drones, not talking about the others. It's unmanageable. If you look into the system we have today, it's pretty much human-centric. Uh, we have evolved a lot in air traffic control, thanks for the FAA. The, the controllers did a great job with what we have today and how the airline have growth, especially here in the US. But if you look at the amount of uh, aircraft, uh, we call them aircraft, will come into the system, it's very unlikely that a man, a controller, will be able to handle all those differences. Uh, we have the UTM being, uh, if you see today how UTM is described, in, in the world we have like 15 different types of UTM. We still don't have a, a clear definition of UTM is. Uh, you go to Europe, they have a different perspective. Here in the US is a different one. And, and it's the same for everyone in the world. Our ATM system have evolved in terms of uh, systems, equipment, but it still depend on the human interface. Uh, I, I don't see that we are going to be able to ever be away from the human taking the decision in the loop. I think we all will have a human taking a decision. But the system will have to be much more reliant on artificial intelligence to be able to handle both uh, the UAVs, the UAS, or the RPAs, how we want to call them, together with, uh, the, how we call them like a vintage, right? Vintage, Legacy. because all this tool <laughs> is not nice. So a vintage operation that you do in Legacy. ATM today. So uh, probably uh, initially our initial reaction is go for segregation, so you segregate their space, so we give them a, a slice of their space. But if you look to the amount of planes and the new aircraft that are coming, uh, we need to go for inclusion. It's not, we are not going to be, to be able to segregate their space. We have to include them in the system. So they have to be part of the discussion. And then we go for what Todd mentioned. We have to have them part of the discussion since the beginning. We have to have regulations in place to make sure that the introduction of those aircraft are made in a, in a way that's not to, going to impact the safety we have today, the level of safety we, we have achieved with uh, the, the aviation and maintaining a, a cohesive uh, approach together with them. Perfect, thanks. So uh, before I open it up to the audience, just a follow-on question, for actually for the whole panel on it. So given the challenges of this information overload, you know, let, let's set aside, let's assume we have standards in place to, you know, to work through it. Are there areas of uh, R&D, right, the areas that companies should be putting their IRAD money against it? Are there new technologies that need to be done? Or do we just need to apply what already exists? Can we handle what we see today and the, and the explosion come in the future? So I, I, I would offer that um, we're going to see the law of diminishing returns happen sooner or later with the 
um, epidermis that we call our airspace structure. Um, we have got to change, I believe, uh, the structure that we have, whether it's A, A through G, A, A, B, C, D, E, G, from an equipage perspective, it, it feels like we continue to try to want to put a Tesla engine in a 57 Chevy. And you can only do that so much to where you get to the point, as Hank and I and others were talking before, where you say maybe it's time to buy a new car. Um, and, and so we have a lot of technology that's going to continue to pressure us as a community to move forward with, but the receiving vehicle, the receiving capability of that is designed from the 50s with radar that to support it was designed from the 50s, and, and we haven't really substantially made that leap forward with that receiving function. So that's what yeah. I would offer. I, 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 fully, I fully agree with that conceptually that I think we are going to have to go to a very dynamic airspace structure with, with more performance-based airspace definition that's going to be much more dynamic. And uh, the analogy I like to look at is uh, road traffic. Mm -hmm. um, so if we look at Waze or Google Maps, right? Um, so traffic, people are still basically going to the same places they were always going. Mm -hmm. But now when you get on the road, you look at a device that says to you, go this way instead of going that way where you're essentially giving real-time guidance and routing information in order to improve and deliver the mission that you want to perform more efficiently. I mean, fundamentally, that's what it's doing. And that's the same thing that we want to do in the airspace. Okay, we're not creating new roads in the process, so it's a little bit more complicated than that. And the second part of it is you have the safety side of it. And I, you asked the, the point on, on cyber earlier. And I think this is where one of the fundamental challenges is, is that we have this, this discontinuity between our safety philosophy, which leads us to design systems, test them, certify them, and then not touch them mm -hmm. because they've been safety certified. Uh, but the cyber threats of having more open systems, using cloud, having uh, more systems interconnected, says you have to be constantly patching and solving vulnerabilities, which doesn't fit with our current safety uh, processes in terms of the speed at which we can test and certify and put something new into service. And so that, to me, is a fundamental area of research and change in the way that we, the way that we test and certify capabilities to bring into, uh, into service. And until we overcome that, we won't be able to move as quickly as we need to to deal with both the safety and the security issues, which have to go hand in hand. Uh, uh, oh, please go ahead. Yeah, and there's, there's a paradigm shift, I think, that is going to hit at some point. Mm -hmm. When you're talking remotely piloted aircraft, that's pretty easy to integrate because you still have a controller talking to a human at the other mm -hmm. end that's controlling the vehicle. When you start talking autonomous vehicles or pre-programmed vehicles that have to be data uh, separated dynamically, and the controller has to do that. We don't, we're not really testing that. We're not really sorting out what that looks like. So maybe one aircraft is a remote vehicle, the next one's got two pilots, the next aircraft behind is one of the autonomous vehicles. That's a whole con ops that really uh, is going to change a lot when that, that comes on board. Yeah. So what are the differences between managing aircraft and managing traffic? It's almost, if, if you look at what we do today, it's almost the same. But when we look at what Hank was talking about, when we are going to, to prioritize between two different type of vehicles, one that is man and one is a man and the other one is autonomous one. And then we look at the, the way we do safe today, we have the target level of safety and then we all go for the same. Are we going to talk about the same type of level of safety for every single aircraft, or we are going to have different level of safety in the one they interacted between themselves? Uh, it's a challenge to, to go. We, we have to change the way we think about safe today, because we assume the whole airspace has the same level of safety. Perhaps we, we, sh we should we start thinking on level of safety around that specific aircraft, what they have on their domain and how they they're going to interact between themselves. Any, any thoughts on that uh, differing safety view? Well, I, I think to go along with uh, 
taking a fresh look at the airspace classification and how we do airspace, you have to look at safety the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think that um, um, the, the good thing about the emerging uh, technology that's coming, they're bringing along with them a computing power like we've never seen before in, in, in aviation. And there's an ability to go and tap it and prove your case so many different ways before they even approach the regulator, right, for, for this capability. But to your question as well, uh, the difference between um, managing traffic and managing aircraft is who does it, in my opinion. Ma managing traffic today is done by the air traffic control organizations and functioning. Managing aircraft, it, to me, is the operator and, and to the pilot and that community. And I, I think there is a subtle difference, but is it going to be that way in 20 years, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what does it need to be? I mean, I think that's, that's part of the discussion that's going on, right, is in the, in the UTM world, there are these discussions about USSs where you're delegating mm -hmm. the responsibility for strategic deconfliction at least, if not more, to the actual operators, which I think conceptually is interesting, but it's, um, it's difficult when you start talking about equity of access to the airspace right. and how do you ensure fairness. First come, first serve. And, exactly. And so, uh, you know, I think um, over the years there have been discussions about applying economic principles to aviation, which I think in the U.S. we've sort of avoided. And I think it goes back to years ago when um, uh, Chicago was being overscheduled and there was a discussion about peak period pricing to try mm -hmm. to... Uh, force economic reality to push uh, the de-peaking of, uh, of operations. And, uh, you know, I think when we start talking about very high-density airspace, like you talked about with Paris, I think we're going to have to bring in some kind of a new principle in terms of how we manage access and, and equitable use of the airspace um, than what we do today, because today's model doesn't scale to that kind of an operation. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. You know, one thing that I hear in the uh, unmanned community and even at, at the FAA level too is there's this idea that integration has to be full integration and I don't think that's true. I think some separation actually makes more sense. If you've got slow flying vehicles using a completely different part of the airport, yeah, you can argue that separation, but it's actually integrated into the transportation mm -hmm. system. So again, open the aperture up. So g given given all these comments, right? So if you need to balance between uh, economics and safety and risk, and we're talking about scaling up drastically to do it, what's the first step? You know, how do we get going at it? What's the first bite of the elephant that has to be done uh, to start making this happen? You know, I think I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of flying. I'm a big fan of going and building and doing things because I don't, I don't think you really know until you start to do it. And so I think you know, some of the establishment of test sites, some of the establishments of areas where these concepts can be, can be flown starts to, you know, starts to create the environment. Experiment. Yeah, to get, creates the environment to look at it. Uh, I don't think we're going far enough, fast enough in, in mm -hmm. utilizing those uh, to really prove out the more advanced things. We're sort of caught on wow, I flew a BB lost mission. Okay, that's great, but that shouldn't be so hard to do. How do you fly 100 BV lost missions in the same area with three of them having lost link and having to re reallocate the airspace and then an emergency where you have to fly a manned helicopter in that, uh, you know, that's, that's the kind of problem we need to figure out how to solve, and that's, that's much harder. Uh, and I think to go along with that, that, that there needs to be a community recognition that this is hard. Yeah, it's a hard prospect. Now, it, that doesn't mean that it's an excuse not to do anything. Mm -hmm. it, it's just that it's a hard dance to have to work through because you've got not only new capabilities, you've got environmental issues like we talked about. Uh, you've got spectrum issues, spectrum availability. How are you going to do that? Um, there is a significant amount of complexities that are involved with this. There's no one silver bullet. So it's like a balloon, you know, that you squeeze, it's just uh -huh. going to blow up in some area, uh, some other area. So I think coming to grips with the complexity of what the picture is first starts the process, in, in my opinion, in moving forward to change things. Please. Uh, I think we, we need to have a little more inclusion. If you look to the panel today, 
we all think in the same way. We all from the mm -hmm. from the Lagos aviation, the one that I mean today. We need to get try to get the the drone community, the RPS community, more involved on the development of the solution, because we we are trying to get the solution for them as well without listen to get them into the discussion. I think this will help. Building on that, I, I mean, I think one thing that's important, and maybe um, I wouldn't always highlight this, but I'll highlight it here because I think it's it's an important. Uh, element of it is the issues around national policy and, and um, industrial economic strategy of countries. So I can tell you today, if you go to China and you go to Shenzhen, there are about two to 3,000 drone operations a day happening in the airspace in Shenzhen. Um, under a regulatory environment and, and working in a way that's been approved. Uh, there are other areas where there are BV loss, uh, cargo, dr unmanned cargo drones flying and delivering heavy payload mm -hmm. across large, large distances. And in China, they've taken an approach that says, okay, we don't have the general aviation problem that, that we have in, that's here in the United States. We're going to let people fly. We're going to give them segregated airspace, and they're going to build up a lot of data by flying a lot of missions. And that's going to support understanding what is the regulations we should put in place, how do we ensure safety, and how do we do things. So the risk that we face in America, that we face in Europe and in different places, is in fact being left behind uh, in other areas where they're taking a fundamentally different approach to the regulatory environment. So rather than dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's, they're going and flying, collecting data, and then using that data to substantiate what the right level of regulation is. Now, that may involve a higher level of risk than we're comfortable taking as a, as a community uh, here in the US or in other places, but we need to recognize that that's what's happening in the world, and that's a, it's a different philosophy and approach than, than what we are facing here today. Would you apply that type of a, an approach you know, in Europe or in the US? How much data do you need to have to be able to make a good decision? Great question. <laughs> No good answer? <laughs> well, let, let me try. Let, let me try one. So in the past few years, we've seen some large uh, unmanned aircraft uh, in disaster relief activities. And those are typically being flown out of metropolitan areas to a site where there's been river floods or uh, the earthquake in Haiti, uh, where I was actively uh, involved in some of that. I would like to see better bridges built between those operations so all of us in this room and those working in these areas can get the forensics of how those operations went, what did the missions look like, how did they work in and out of the metropolitan areas at the time. Uh, they all worked pretty well, and I don't recall any evidence that there was any conflict or anything like that. But when we do do big things with unmanned systems and unmanned aircraft, I'd like to see a better data bridge coming back at us, because it's going to help us inform how to build these next steps as you were talking. So I had a discussion earlier this morning with uh, Greg from MITRE on it, and that, that was one of the suggestions I had. Boy, this is a perfect opportunity for one of the FFRDCs to go back and to do that uh, data analysis, just to gather the information. I, I would propose that a lot of that is already there. Mm -hmm. We just don't collate it. And then again, I'll pose the question, what is good enough? You know, do we know where that point is? So ladies and gentlemen, with that, let me open it up to, to the audience. Uh, just to let you know, uh, we had a, a telephone discussion last week that uh, I think we spent about 45 minutes uh, you know, solving the world's problem. And um, every one of these uh, you know, experts here will talk your ear off on it. So I've been pleased so far that they've been pretty concise uh, on their answers. But uh, let me start, see if there are any email questions. <laughs> We do actually have an email question. Uh, this, uh, this person would like to know the panel's thoughts on, can UTM provide truly seamless integration of UAS traffic, such as commercial drones, some of which will be pop-ups, with conventional aircraft traffic in high-density airspace, and can we rely on highly automated conflict detection? So I'm, I'm happy to start with that, and uh, it's one of the things that uh, I'm involved with, with CANSO, and, uh, the Civil Air Navigation Service Organization. Um, 
the, the real hard part with that question is what is UTM? Uh, what does a UAS traffic management system look like? Uh, what is its intended function? Uh, what are the interface control documents that are going to be needed for, or the interface drones, if you will, that are going to have to comply with the UTM service provider and the system they developed? Are they actually going to separate airplanes like a TCAS or like a visual eye? Or are they going to just do route separation? Are they going to do it in a VFR environment or an IFR environment or both or special VFR? Right? Are they going to um, be solely independent and sufficient? Will there be multiple UTM provisions in the same area that they're being certified and licensed to do? And then finally, what happens if somebody breaks your cord? What happens if you pull your power and your system goes down and these 300 vehicles that you've been managing with your system now are gonna be managed by who? Uh, and, and how does that contingency operation happen? All of that to say this is fundamentally a game changer, UTM is. But we've got a long way to go in terms of the true value benefit, the value proposition for what this capability holds. And we need the data to defend that. So. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, I think we still don't have a definition of what UTM is. Uh, we have capability, we have technology. I don't think this is a limitation to what we can do or not. It's really to define what we really want for the UTM system to be. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be in the same model as we have today. We have one air navigation service provider responsible for one area. It might be like we do for the mobile phones. We have several different providers, and you choose the one you want to use, depending on the agreement we have. And we have a centralized database of information. Everyone will go there and pick the information they want, like the swim, in the swim right. environment. But we don't have it defined. So it's, it's the future. Of course, we have to go in that direction, but we still don't have the north. Yeah, so I, I think from a technology perspective, there's no question in my mind but technologically, we can do what's being asked. Not at all concerned about that. Um, and I think that the challenges are largely around policy and how we structure the mm -hmm. concept of operations. Um, when we do start talking about multiple overlapping providers or not, I think we need to fundamentally understand that there are some things which are just going to be authoritative services that are going to be done by an ANSP, a government agency, or somebody. And so the airspace structure and design is fundamentally a governmental sovereignty oriented yeah. mission um, that is going to be governmental. It's going to be an authoritative service. And those sorts of things certainly are going to fall into one place and going to be managed in a certain way. There are a lot of things like mission planning, about deconfliction, et cetera, that could be delegated sure. and could be done by many people. And so there's a lot of experimentation going on today on where to draw that boundary and what makes sense. And in different places, there are different approaches being taken. So there's a lot to be to be learned, but you know, the challenge I would give to anybody is go outside and, and so tonight at the reception, look standing on the roof, look out for a while and see how many things you see flying. The reality is there's a lot of airspace yeah. that's not used very much mm -hmm. because we have a very wide safety margin around everything. Mm -hmm. So we can fit a lot more things in there if we have the ability to segment the airspace, to control it, to manage it, to know where things are. And, and so I, I think there is a lot of opportunity for growth, but it, it's a fundamental rethinking about the way we work. Is, so is it a, a policy issue, or is it our own you know, personal bias or limitation? As you, you said it's not a technology thing. So what is, what is it? What, what is that part? Yeah, so I, don't, I don't know that I agree that it's not a technology issue. I, I, I do believe that um, you know, I stood outside of my house uh, a month or two ago in Melbourne, and I and I saw three rocket launches simultaneously, and I saw two come back and land at the same place, right? Fundamentally amazing. It's amazing, and it gives you kind of the encouragement that, yeah, we're in a different era, and we can go do some things that we've never done before, and the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 for Northrop Grumman is pretty important. Um, but, but in terms of, you know, how does that, how does that factor into all the other nuances of developing a new system. If it's 500 feet and below that you're talking about developing whatever UTM is, uh, 
I don't want these things flying over my house, creating a new route over my house, making these noises at two, three hundred feet. We've got to, we've got to assume a lot of things, and, and, and with that capability of being down low or requirement or whatever the interface is, now you're going to have challenges with frequency spectrum interference, and, and you're going to have other capabilities. And I still have to miss the other guys that are flying. Um, so there, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things beyond just. Re reclassifying the airspace to being something that it's not today. So, I, and, and, and I appreciate that because I think, I think what Todd's saying is that, like I was mentioning, I, I don't think there's anything we can't do hardly anymore mm -hmm. given the mm -hmm. capabilities yes. that are out there. Yes. But we, we haven't resolved yet what all the issues are to go work with this stuff yet, so. Hey. Yeah, so we have, let me paint a picture because I think we have a couple of opportunities to kind of flex our imagination. Uh, today, um, you have countries with air traffic control systems, and quite a few of them are quite different. Some have radar, some don't have radar. Uh, down in Africa, where I was recently, they literally have to call back and forth between two countries to do handoffs uh, because there's no electronic way of doing it. Uh, that works. I mean, the system still works because the interfaces are established. I see two ATM environments or, or UTM environments, the one that integrates with the normal traffic flows. But when you're in the city flying between buildings where there aren't any other aircraft flying and, and helicopters flying between buildings and you're delivering packages from a distribution center where Doug lives uh, into a city center, that's a whole different UTM concept. Um, it, so we may need to think about having a couple of different con ops around what a UTM environment should look like, not just think of you know, one big bubble here. Mm. Yeah, I, I think you really start talking about performance-based approach mm -hmm. in a very broad mm -hmm. sense, not mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. you know, PBN, et cetera, but right. really thinking about what performance do you need to, to do something in the airspace. And I think if you apply that concept, you can apply it to communication, to navigation surveillance. You can apply it to trust as well, which is going to be very important. When you start having yeah. vehicles flying close to government buildings, how do I know the information I'm getting from this vehicle is actually yeah. a vehicle? How do I know it is where it says it is, et cetera? So we're going to have to apply performance levels to trust as well, um, and um, you know, and so I do think that's the kind of notion we need to move to. And so there are places where the performance level can be very low because there's not much traffic; it's not a problem. And there's places where the performance levels can be much higher than what we expect today because the traffic density and the performance or sure. the, the requirements the are risk. different. Yeah. The risk, and that's the same for the security as we are discussing. You probably have a different perception for security and safety as well, mm, yes. depending on where you go. Like if we look at today, we take a Uber. Ten years ago, if we asked someone, you're going to jump in someone's car that you don't know how they drive, uh, the maintenance of the car, you said, no, hell, I'm never going to do it. And everybody goes outside there today and do it. So the air traffic controllers will be rating uh, each one of these uh, UASs, so we we'll know if uh, he's a... <laughs> yeah, and they can get the tip as well, depending yeah, on how you right. I know we've got Alpha in the room. I don't know if Matt is here as well. Oh, yeah, Matt is here. So, uh, ladies and are, are there any more email questions? On? Yeah. Yeah, hi, we have a question from the audience. Uh, and the question is, what is being done to educate UAS hobbyists? specifically regarding safety risk within controlled airspace situations like Chicago, Dallas, Denver, Atlanta, incursions with aircraft on final. You know, I won't speak for the FAA, but I know yesterday at the, at the FAA UAS symposium, they were talking about the things that they're doing. And I think there's a, and we see it around the world, there are a lot of good efforts that are happening around education. Uh, so the FAA has got a series of videos on YouTube to educate people about what are airspace classifications, where can you fly, where can you not fly. Um, so I think there are a lot of efforts that are underway and being launched around this education piece, which is critical because most of the new p the people coming into the environment as UAS pilots, most of the hobbyists, in fact, are not aviation people. They don't know a mm -hmm. class of airspace if it, if it fell on them, right? Um, and so I think there are a lot, of, a lot of good efforts. I think there's more to be done, and I think there'll be more, ultimately, it has to be placed on the manufacturers of drones to put more educational materials out and to, and to educate people more. But I, 
to, to be honest, I think there's a lot of good activities that are already launched. Yeah, but the threat is real because yes. uh, the people in uh, London who are against the third runway at Heathrow are right now threatening to use drones to dis disrupt Heathrow as a protest. Yes. So there's already people out there who want to weaponize the use mm -hmm. of drones to disrupt. But that's criminal, not clueless, right? Which Correct. is which that's is different. Criminal, yeah. So I'll just give a, a, a maybe a contrary perspective yeah. on it. I grew up on a dairy farm in Minnesota. When I go up, you know, my neighbors that are farmers are using uh, UAVs or drones to go out to check on uh, everything from uh, lidar on the fields to. And none of these guys, I mean, these are, I would call them stubborn farmers, right? They're not going to go do anything that they, you know, they're not going to look at any of that. Now, if you had a standard and a requirement, they would do it. So they have to be certified to buy the chemicals that they use on it. There's a standard that's in place, and they go off and follow it. If you had those same type of standards, they would learn the things uh, that, that you would want on it. Well, but you're but always going to have a group of people that won't do it. We, we have standards, and, and maybe yeah. uh, we haven't done a very good job of getting them out, but 14... Uh, no, it's, it's USC, I, f I forget the uh, five letter USC, Paul help me out, but um, it, it, it says anything that's contrived or developed to fly requires uh, an airworthiness certificate. Anything that is being flown requires a pilot certificate. There are things, and, and unmanned aircraft, whatever the size, were classified as aircraft back in 2007. Right by the FAA, I was around and got the scars from that issue as well. So, so from a perspective that says, well, at least they can do if they're flying something is understand whether or not they're complying with regulations. Now, they don't have to necessarily meet those regulations, but at least they become aware of the fact that um, I, I do need to be complying with something out there. There, there are some existing rules somewhere. So, you know, when when's enough enough at a certain point? Could we go to a question from the audience? I want to at least give you. I see a bunch of them. I'll let the guys in the back pick because I can't see who put their hand up first. <laughs> Thank you very much for this discussion. Uh, Cycle and Robin Collins Aerospace. One quick question What level of onus or quality do you anticipate on the certification of the relevant payloads for CNS on these drones? Maybe I'll start and you can follow up. I mean, I think the, the work that's been ongoing is looking at uh, the airspace and counter classifications versus effectively the energy of the vehicle to say the, uh, the failure rate has got to be driven by the risk of the operation fundamentally. And so if you're a large, if you're a large platform, you're going to be certified like, like avionics on a civil aircraft today. And if you're a, a 250 gram thing, it's a toy. And somewhere in between, there are a number of different steps of different, different certification levels. And part of the challenge, and where we are short on standards, is at the lower end of that spectrum, yeah, yeah. they don't really exist yet. And so I think there's a recognition that there is something that's below uh, DAL B, DAL C certification that's required for something that is not like a 737. Mm -hmm. um, and that's still a work in progress, but I, I think um, there are going to be formalized approaches, and probably at the lower end will be much more like product certification like you have on a cell phone or something like that, where the manufacturer will get a certification uh, according to their design and, and manufacturing processes. So I, I, think, I think Todd's right on. I think to go along with that as well, uh, there, there's been, uh, due to the uniqueness of the emerging technologies, there's a tendency to want to use commercial off-the-shelf equipment, right? And um, and, and that may be okay, but you still need to, as, as uh, some of us say, anything you want to put on an airplane needs to earn its way on the airplane, right? right. And, and so from the perspective that says if it's mission critical, uh, maybe not flight critical, are, are those decisions still and discussions still being had? And, and where does that bifurcate? Uh, or are they too blended because, again, they're commercial off the shelf and there's no bifurcation of it, then how do you move forward with it? So good question. Yeah. The, the only, maybe the only other thing to add on to that, which I think is an interesting twist, is that you know, when we talk about navigation and communication in particular, uh, we do have devices like we do IoT devices, for example, for automotive. And automotive is also a safety-driven industry. 
And so there are standards for automotive, which are different than what aviation mm -hmm. has, um, that may become applicable for some of the technologies. But I don't think you're going to go you know, build something in your garage and put it on an aircraft uh, and, and get it certified. It's going to be meeting some safety qualification and going through some formalized and rigorous process. Thanks. We have time for one question, please. Yeah, um, my question is related to aerospace since it seems like everyone's interested in that. We're all in it. It's all above us. Um, just looking back over time, geographic areas have been used to, to move people. Railroads were followed by highways. Same thing with telegraph. Now the same telegraph lines or fiber optic lines going to the same buildings. So my question has to do with uh, do you expect that UAS will be allowed, let's say, free flight, where they'll be allowed to go even in urban areas, kind of from point A to B, kind of closest path? Or would you consider leveraging that current geographic transportation grid, highways, railroads, maybe even above power lines where there's not a lot of population, and allow kind of organized highways of U, uh, UAS vehicles partially to address the public concern where they're not on the highway except when they're driving underneath one. So um, that, that's my question. It, it, to me, it's, it's very practical first step that, that should be considered. Uh, you, you, wanna, you wanna do, when you're emerging this technology, you wanna put it in places that it will do no harm or the least amount of harm if something fails. And we don't know enough about what failure modes look like as we found out with the 737 MAX. Uh, you know, there are going to be surprises when you're deploying these sorts of things. So starting with something like you just um, recommended uh, may make a sensible way of uh, putting a toe in the water, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. And, I, and I totally agree with, with, with what he said. That part of the introduction of drones will be building trust from the community. And to do it in a way, it has to be an evolutionary implementation. It can be like radical. So we've run out of time, and so first let me thank the panel, these experts on it. You can see they have a passion for what they do, and they have a wealth of information. And I know each and every one of them would enjoy opportunity to talk with you about this uh, through the rest of it or tonight during the uh, reception. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for the great questions on it. Uh, again, we enjoy being able to respond. And uh, finally, you know, our RTCA and Terry, thank you for letting us come in. We, we think this was a great topic, and we appreciate the chance to be here. All right, very good. Thank you.